speaker tonight is Camilla Lever. Now, I first met Camilla back in 2004. We were both working as dietitians in Port Augusta. And uh, I really enjoyed working alongside Camilla. It was a short-term locum on my behalf, but she was there for many years. And I really admired and looked up to Camilla as a colleague. And of course, as, as fate would have it, we've both moved now into the cancer prevention and cancer screening space, me at Cancer Council SA and her for Wellbeing SA. So tonight, Camilla is supported by her colleague, Sue Glenn. And Camilla, I'm gonna let you steer the reins. I'll just check everyone can hear me. Can you can you hear my, um, I've got my microphone on? Yes. Yes. All right. So um, I will just introduce us. Um, you may not have heard of Wellbeing SA before. That's because it's a newly created, um, it's called an attached office um, to the Department of Health. But we're essentially the bit of um, the Department of Health and Wellbeing that does um, prevention and and uh, sort of does work across the spectrum of early intervention as well. But um, particularly our team is around cancer screening and Sue is the bowel cancer program manager for the state. So she, um, she sort of um, does a lot of the um, liaison with the, the national program. So I, I really appreciate having Sue on board tonight and I might throw any complex questions to her. Um, and I'll move on. I, I would also like to pay my respects to the Aboriginal owners of this country and um, particularly in this topic, reflect on, you know, how we can address, you know, some of the systemic um, racism that still is in the health system and, and everyone's potential role to make a difference in that space. So um, thank you for the acknowledgement of country before. And I can't speak highly enough for Aboriginal people that um, working health council inside us journey. So I'm just going to quickly talk a bit about the incidence of uh, bowel cancer in, the, in Australia and um, this map uh, shows that Australia, the darker areas are higher levels of incidence. So Australia does kind of feature quite highly on, on the national stage, international stage for bowel cancer. And to put those numbers um, into perspective, um, I've, on the left, we've got colon cancer and on the right, we've got rectal cancer. And you'll see, um, even though it's very tiny figures, that Australia and New Zealand really um, do rank fairly highly. So it really is an important cancer for us to be addressing in Australia. And I think it's um, wonderful, particularly wonderful, that we have a really great test to offer people that is able to pick up cancer at such an early stage. Um, with many of the cancers that you'd be dealing with, you would well know that by the time someone um, presents with symptoms, um, the diseases often progress to a point where um, it is quite a, a life-changing event. Bowel cancer is unique in that, um, you know, there's only a few cancers we have that where we can offer a really good early stage test. And so I really want to encourage you tonight to come away with thinking about the opportunities that exist with bowel screening for your clients. And well, I'm just going to move back one. So just to look at the trends of bowel cancer rates, and again, tiny writing, I'm sorry, but um, the ma males are in blue and the females are in yellow, and the um, incidence is the, the, the full lines and the dotted lines are the mortality. What you can see there is that we have had a, a period of um, a bit of a peak in the sort of um, mid 90s, but we are getting a bit on top of bowel cancer in incidence and mortality. We're making little dents and making slow progress in that area. And I think part of that is attributed to our, you know, systematic approach to screening. And so again, really encouraging people to think about screening participation tonight. This figure talks yeah. about, sorry, can I hear any, is that a question? Yeah, okay, I'll continue. Um, I'll just open my chat bar in case there's any. Um, a minute. I've just my presentation. Just bear with me. But I do know what. Um, all right. Sorry about that. I'll have to move on. There we go. Right. So, um, for any participation with men and women, um, 
on the left, you'll see that the participation rate improves with age, um, but that really picks out some areas of focus in that the younger age groups are, are not participating to the extent that they could. And definitely at any age group, men are less likely to participate than women. And on the right, you'll see that participation rate for um, people who've screened in the past is higher, whereas first timers is quite low. So again, that points to areas that we could be focusing on with our clients around getting people to do it the first time and getting men to, to engage and getting people to do it at a younger age. Um, in a, at the moment, the, um, the eligibility starts at 50. And so um, really encouraging people at, from age 50 to get screening um, right from when they begin eligibility. The heat maps for screening participation are also quite hard to see. I do apologise, it's not the best format for sharing um, information tonight, but what you can see from this is that the darker areas show where participation is higher in the state. It, it doesn't necessarily follow the same um, patterns of other screening participation or, um, you know, it doesn't always follow socioeconomic status, but there is a general trend, I guess, that you can see there around um, some areas of disadvantage also having lower participation rates, such as Davron Park. But there are there are interesting um, discrepancies there, like York Peninsula is doing quite well. Um, so it, again, these heat maps can help us target where to go and um, and also find out what's working in the areas that are achieving good participation. And this slide is a lot of little numbers and um, the main point of it, I would say, is to get down to the very bottom of all people in South Australia. On average, we're achieving about 46.4% overall. Um, that's a, accumulated from women doing, you know, slightly better than men and older people doing slightly better than younger, um, which is great compared to the national rate, which is only 41%. So comparatively speaking, we do a good job in South Australia. But when you think about it, that's only, that's less than half. So um, we're missing over half of the eligible population. So it really is, it's a, a bit of a conundrum in that we have this great test. It's free. You can do it at home. We just need to get people involved in the program and we can get some really huge wins. That's where we'll get the biggest bang for our buck with bowel cancer prevention is just getting more people to participate in the screening. And I know that Nora will be speaking later about some of her really great work with the ambassadors around just getting people to participate and Jacqueline will as well. And Jacqueline has asked me to talk a bit about the cultural, um, the multicultural data. So I'm just going to touch on that. Um, and, and just flag that, um, you know, we know that people with a language who use a language other than English at home have lower participation in screening. But when they do come up, um, when they do screen, they have a higher positivity rate. So they're more likely to have had cancer kind of um, going on. And also that um, despite that, they have lower diagnostic follow up. So it's actually a cluster of risk factors there that we really need to um, really highlight the need to work with people who um, have a language other than English that they speak at home. And this same trend is um, evident for the Aboriginal population as well um, from what data that we have. And uh, so it really points to the need to support those groups that are at lower, uh, risk of lower screening participation. So I just, I'm not sure if this is really the time to have a chat. But I did want to just say that um, it is good to think about what you already know about the program at this point. So um, maybe I will throw to the audience at the end, um, but just have a reflection because often um, when I talk to people about bowel screening, they say, yeah, 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 I did that. I've done that. I know what I'm doing. And then when I show them the actual thing, the kit, it's a bit of a mystery. So I think what happens with bowel screening is people are a little bit embarrassed about the topic and they either want us to stop talking about it um, or they have provided a faecal sample in the past for perhaps other investigations or they may have completed a commercial kit with their GP. Um, but this is the kit, this is the national kit and I really do wanna encourage people to support their clients to get onto the national program. Um, and I've included the number there in the slide. So you have this for when you go home. 
And the reasons that I would really encourage the national program is that you have two yearly reminders from when you start. So even if your clients move into state or um, go to a different practice, they have that two yearly reminder invitation um, to participate in screening um, and it follows them wherever their Medicare address goes. It's free, um, it's done in the privacy of your own home. Um, but the, the really good thing about the national program is that when people have a positive result, there is very active follow up. So um, I know doctors and, and nurses do a lot of follow up as well, but these officers, the participant follow up officers or PFAF officers are on the on every case that has a positive result and they really do a good job of um, actively trying to engage people who haven't had the follow up tests to really get in and get a colonoscopy or get what they need to, to, to go through the, um, the pathway of cancer screening um, and make sure they don't get lost because it's such a shame when people um, are lost to follow up from this program. It just, it's a real lost opportunity. Um, there's lots of resources like how to complete the kit and frequently asked questions. I'll quickly breeze through the last little bits um, because I think you can have a look at the slides yourself and play with um, those resources later. But I did want to say some of the challenges we're up against is really just getting a past people's, um, I guess, sense that this kit can be put aside or done later or they don't want to know the results or it's too embarrassing. So really dealing with those, giving people the motivation to to participate is such a huge opportunity to catch cancer at an early stage, at a stage where it isn't even cancer. Um, we just really have so few tests that can do that. Um, the forms and the processes are a challenge, and I'm sure Jacqueline will um, attest to that when she talks. We have to sort of deal with, you know, the whole process. Um, so the sample, you need to collect two samples, they need to remain cool, people put them in their fridge, that causes, you know, anxiety for some people, and there can be issues with Medicare address details. Um, and I just wanted to flag that, you know, the solutions for us are really providing that extra layer of support for the people at most risk of not doing it. So encouraging people to actually follow through, um, rather than just recommending it, kind of following up and trying to provide opportunities for people to ask questions. Um, working with, you know, the younger people, the first timers, the men, people um, experiencing socioeconomic disadvantage, people experiencing other forms of um, systemic, um, you know, exclusion, such as, you know, perhaps your Aboriginal and cold communities um, don't feel comfortable talking about these issues. So it really is important that we have culturally appropriate services around them. And, and my big take home is like, um, the more you get your experience up with dealing with the information line and the and the materials that are in the national kit, the more you'll find it easy to help people. So I know that sitting, if you've got time, wherever possible, if people have have to call that information line and get a new kit or get a get get one issued because they've moved house or whatever, um, doing it with them gives you an insight into the process. So doing it with the patients. I've got there the links for new um, sample kits and resources. And the other big tip is I would say, do the participant details form yourself so that you know what questions um, you have to fill out in that. Because it is quite a long form and I think people um, with language barriers or anxiety about the health system, really it's, it's assumed that people can just do the kit themselves. But the more you explain it and have familiarity with it, the more you can help people to do that because it, it isn't necessarily self-explanatory. And the reason we do it is because cancer detected through screening is associated with longer life. So this line at the top is survival of people with screen detected bowel cancer. And again, um, this is because predominantly we're detecting cancer at an earlier stage. So I will wrap up there for any questions, but I just really encourage you to um, think about how you can get people into participating with the national program. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Camilla. Uh, just uh, very quickly, my name is Jill Miller. I'm co-hosting with um, Carissa tonight, my co-worker, um, and I'll be looking after the question part of the evening. So thank you for that wonderful presentation, um, Camilla. I think it's wonderful to know that South Australia does a good job, but we still need more people to um, be encouraged to do the test. 
Certainly on the 13 11 20 number for information and support, we encourage anyone that rings up there to do the test. And when I go out and talk to health professionals in the clinical setting, we certainly promote um, uh, the testing to be done. Um, so thank you for that. Um, are there any questions? Uh, you can either unmute or you can write it in the, in the chat line and I can um, call it out to Camilla or to Sue, who's um, uh, with Camilla. So are there any questions? No, very quiet audience tonight. They, they know I went over time. I'm more than happy to get emails afterwards as well. So if anyone needs to contact us down the track, um, yeah, they can go through Carissa. Okay, thank you, um, Camilla. And certainly, I think the questions come up later when you sit back and think about what's been said. Um, so if any questions do come through, um, um, send them through to uh, Carissa or we can uh, and contact um, Camilla to answer them for you. Okay, I will hand back to Carissa now to um, present uh, Nat to you, another colleague of ours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jill. And thank you again, Camilla, for sharing those insights. So our next speaker tonight is my pleasure to introduce you to my colleague, Natalie Bowe. So Natalie is a Community Education Project Officer and a dietitian, and she works here at Cancer Council SA. And she's going to share you with you the latest information about bowel cancer prevention. So thank you, Natalie. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Hopefully, um, Chris, I'll just check with you that you can hear me correctly. Yes, we can hear you. Thanks, right. Natalie. All right, fantastic. So um, tonight I'm just going to really go through the six ways that we can cut our bowel cancer risk um, through lifestyle changes. Um, and, and these are really um, important factors to keep talking to clients about. Um, not all will be relevant to every client, um, but I just want to cover the six things that we uh, are really important in bowel cancer prevention. So to start with, uh, eat a healthy diet that's high in dietary fibre. And I'm really going to focus probably uh, speaking about that dietary fibre aspect tonight rather than um, just the normal healthy eating because I'm sure most of us have all seen the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating before. Um, and so Cancer Council supports the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating in terms of that um, following a healthy diet, two serves of fruit, five serves of vegetables, whole grain um, breads and cereals, and, and limiting those uh, sugary drinks, those foods high in sugar and fat, you know, those general rules um, are, are important to follow. Um, but today, yeah, like I said, I'm really going to focus on that dietary fibre aspect and what role that has to play. <clears throat> and I just wanted to add in here um, that only a one in 10 um, people are eating enough veggies. And we know that with just two extra serves of veggies, we can actually reduce bowel cancer risk. So a vegetable focus is something that um, fits in with the dietary fibre and something that we can really encourage um, clients to look at increasing. And a small increase can make quite a, different, uh, quite a difference, particularly for those who are nowhere near the five serves. Um, you know, just to encouraging, you know, just that even that two extra serves can make a difference. So heading on to dietary fibre. So dietary fibre is... Um, very important in, to, in terms of, um, which is quite a, a key word at the moment, our microbiome or our microbiota. I'm sure many of you have heard about uh, the it word, um, but dietary fiber is key to making sure that this functions very well and our gut bugs, um, another easy way to, to talk about them, are flourishing. And, and we know through the research that if we have a healthy gut, um, not only does it help prevent against bowel cancer, it is also very important to things like brain health. There's an axis between our gut and our brain. Uh, you know, the axis that we're knowing now and we're finding between a lot of the major organs that if this gut is working well, um, that our overall health is really, really improved. So um, it's you know, it's about talking to people about dietary fibre. And while some of this is a bit sciencey and we don't need to talk about it to clients about it, it's just um, building that understanding about what fibre is and where we can find it and where we can encourage people to increase it um, so that we can uh, improve our gut health and therefore protect, protect against bowel cancer. Um, so basically dietary fibre is any part of the food that's not digested in the small intestine that moves into the colon where it's partially or completely fermented by bacteria. 
Um, so there's three different types, um, soluble, insoluble and resistant starch. And I'm probably going to focus a bit on resistant starch today because in terms of the gut microbiome, resistant starch is sort of looking like a, a gold standard for what it does in terms of keeping those bugs healthy. Um, so in the, uh, in the intestine, um, the, the dietary fibre or the resistant starch is fermented to release short-chain fatty acids. And these short-chain chain fatty acids like butyrate are very vital to keeping the cells of the lining of the gut healthy. And clearly when we're talking about bowel cancer risk, if we have a healthy gut lining, that is protective around damage happening to those cells. Uh, these foods are probably less common in an Australian um, environment, except for, you know, high maize, which is put into some commercial foods like breads and cereals. But, uh, you know, in our culture, um, we, you know, we don't tend to eat underripe uh, bananas or slightly undercooked pastas, so it can be quite hard and challenging to to include in your diet. Um, but the cooked and cooled potato and rice is some something that we can um, encourage people to include um, more so in their diets to boost up this resistant starch and these short chain fatty acids. And in in fact, of in in terms of the dietary fiber, the key thing is. Uh, not just eating fruits and vegetables in the right amount, it's about using the huge variety that we have. It's all about diversity. So if you think about it in terms of, you know, if you only eat apples and bananas and you have your standard veggies that you eat each day, uh, you're not going to be feeding all these different um, bugs in your gut as well as if you were providing a whole array of different fruits, vegetables, breads and cereals um, that can then feed the different types of bugs in different ways to improve the health of the gut lining. So when we're talking to people, something that I really am um, passionate about talking about is it's not just including fruits and vegetables, it's how many different types and how much variety can you include in your day. Um, and then, of course, there's the other um, dietary fibres, insoluble and insoluble fibre uh, that, that also have, a, have an important role to play. And basically, they're in our fruits, vegetables, those whole grains, uh, and not forgetting legumes and um, lentils and things like that as well. So, again, if we can talk to people about boosting their dietary fibre, um, we, we can go a long way to help protecting ourselves against bowel cancer. So, I guess, how does dietary fibre um, help protect against bowel cancer? So, one of those ones that I've already spoken about is... Um, the short chain fatty acids um, that boost that gut lining health, um, but also it binds carcinogens or cancer causing um, substances in the bowel and gets them out of the bowel, uh, moves them through nice and quickly. Um, and in an indirect way, um, it helps us feel full for longer, which can help with mate, weight maintenance. And that's an independent factor uh, for bowel cancer. So that's quite a key role that it plays as well. <clears throat> And also it reduces the absorption, absorption of carbohydrates into the blood and reduces insulin resistance and therefore reducing the risk of diabetes and some cancers. So it has a number of roles that it plays in terms of cancer risk. Um, and that's why I guess it's a real focus while we talk about eating a healthy diet. It's also that next stage of also talking about dietary fibre. So how much will we be aiming for? So 25 grams for females and 30 grams for males. Um, but really, it's the more the better. And again, it's that diversity that is the crucial element of dietary fibre. Moving on to uh, the next um, prevention message, it's limit or avoid processed meat and limit red meat to no more than 450 grams per week. Um, and that can reduce your bowel cancer risk. So bread and processed meats, we know um, processed meat is a group one carcinogen, so we know that it can cause cancer. And red meat is a group two A carcinogen, which means it probably causes cancer. Um, but it's been found that processed meat is twice as potent or twice as bad as what red meat is. And I guess that's why we, in terms of our uh, messaging around limiting or avoiding processed meat, whereas when we're talking about red meat, we, we more so talk about reducing the amount that we eat. So with every 100 grams of red meat, um, your bowel cancer risk is increased by 17% and just 50 grams of processed meat. So that's where we come that, double, you know, while it's doubly as bad, 
um, increases bowel cancer risk by 18%. And, you know, 15, 50 grams of processed meat isn't all that much. It's probably the amount you'd make to make, uh, you'd use to make a ham roll or something like that. So we're not talking huge amounts of meat here. Um, and, and I guess it comes back to the more you eat, the higher your risk in terms of bowel cancer. So the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare attributes 7.7% of um, colorectal cancers to diets high in processed meat. And I, I guess I'm just focusing on processed meat here tonight just to showcase um, why we're really trying to hone in on that um, limit or avoid um, the processed meat. And, and so that 7.7%, if we look at data from 2019 and we work out the calculations, it, and I know that it's not entirely um, uh, accurate, but it, you know, it's a, a good gauge for us to look at how, um, how much of an impact uh, this processed meat is having. Um, that processed meat is, uh, contributes to over 1,200 cases of bowel cancer and over 400 deaths. So quite significant in terms of um, the risk that it's putting on um, our clients in terms of bowel cancer risk and why we need to start really honing in and talking about processed meat intake. And it's thought that the chemicals are responsible um, to, make the, to making these red meats and the processed meat carcinogenic. Um, and particularly, probably nitrates reaction um, with heme, which is in our red meat, which again is a bit scientific and we don't need to talk to people about that, but it just... Um, it really is those chemicals that are naturally occurring and added that are problematic and, and why we're looking at um, avoiding processed meat. Uh, so I've set our recommendations there. Um, and then in terms of our lean meat, it's about a palm size served three to four times a week. Seems reasonable um, because our red meat still does contribute some um, good nutrients to our diet. Uh, and, in, and in addition to uh, our limiting red and processed meats, it's also limiting the consumption of burnt or charred meat, which can be carcinogenic as well. And instead of, uh, you know, looking at these red meats, what else can we include in our diet? So lean cuts of chicken, fish and plant-based proteins um, are quite important to, to try and substitute into our diet. And, you know, there is a huge focus on plant-based foods at the moment. And, you know, it's really great to encourage people to try vegetarian meals, you know, um, add a vegetarian meal once or twice a week into their diets. Um, not only uh, does it eliminate some of the processed meat or red meat that we're having, it also boosts that um, dietary fibre that we're going to have and also our vegetable intake. And we know only a couple of extra serves boosts, uh, reduces our bowel cancer risk. Uh, moving on to exercise now. So in terms of cancer prevention, we talk about 30 minutes of vigorous exercise or 60 minutes of moderate intensity exercise on most days. And this is, uh, I guess, double of what um, for general health we, we talk about. In, but in terms of that cancer prevention, we know that this is the amount of exercise that we need people to be doing. Um, and exercise, of course, has that added benefit of um, reducing the chance of you being overweight or obese, um, which was that independent risk factor for bowel cancer as well. Uh, and so it's all about, you know, 60 minutes of moderate intensity activity could be quite daunting for someone that isn't exercising much. Um, so, you know, any be exercise is better than none, um, but encouraging people to find things that they find enjoyable, um, people they can meet to walk with, um, that it doesn't have to be 60 minutes in a row that they're doing, what activities can they do, trying to get people um, into whatever exercise they can because we know how much, how important that is, I guess, in terms of bowel cancer prevention um, and really trying to reach up to that 60 minutes a day or, or if um, people are wanting to be vigorous, uh, do vigorous exercise 30 minutes a day. Uh, as I mentioned, um, maintaining a healthy weight is a, a factor that we need to look at as well. So how does healthy weight influence your cancer risk? So fat cells produce growth factors and hormones and being above a healthy weight can cause inflammation. So increased growth factors with the increased fat cells, increased hormones and increased inflammation may change how the cells in your body divide. So you can see in number two here um, that the cells are dividing normally. Um, but as we increase our number of fat cells, increase the growth factors, the hormones and the inflammation, in number three, you can see that the cells can start to mutate and errors can be made. 
And in turn, um, obviously those repeated errors uh, can develop into the early stages of cancer. So we do know that the, that, that um, I guess, system, um, as we increase weight and become overweight or obese, um, becomes more likely that some of these errors may start to occur. And so what do we look for with our clients? So waist circumference is a really great way um, and can be a great way is if, if you feel it's appropriate to do a waist circumference on someone to start the conversation about um, weight and cancer risk and, you know, and other, obviously, other um, comorbidities that come with being overweight or obese. Um, but it can be a conversation started with the right person because sometimes people don't know where they sit and, and waist circumference is uh, something that we can use quite easily. So uh, I don't need to probably go through it here, but you can, um, oh, sorry, those, I might just have to fix up those slides. Those numbers are incorrect there. Um, on the first one for no elevated risk um, is correct. And then we go obviously more than 94 centimetres and more than 80 centimetres for the second one. Um, so I'll fix those up, sorry, and um, make sure that they come through on the slides so that you have something to refer to if you are looking to use waist circumference um, at all in your clinics. So about, I guess, um, being overweight and obese is something that can be quite challenging um, in the clinical setting to speak to people about. Um, but we're really trying to encourage people to, you know, follow that healthy diet exercise you know we're talking about 30 to 60 minutes a day exercise can really help um, minimize weight gain or help with weight loss um, and even for people that are continuing to gain weight you know even starting re setting realistic goals like preventing any more weight gain can be a great place to start you know it has to be achievable um, the changes may need to be um absolutely maintainable um, because what we know is strict diets and fad diets often you know the yo-yo dieting occurs and and then no benefit in terms of uh, waist circumference or whether they're overweight or obese um, so working with people around um, those key messages about um, what it takes to to eat a healthy diet so avoiding or limiting alcohol is our next uh, step of the six steps so we know alcohol, again, is a group one carcinogen so that it causes cancer. Mm -hmm. And I guess uh, in terms of why alcohol causes cancer is alcohol in alcoholic drinks is converted into a toxic substance. Um, it can increase the production of hormones such as estrogen, which can, be, uh, can trigger um, certain cancers. And it can alter cell function by changing folate metabolism. So there's a number of ways in which alcohol um, is... Or, can cause cancer and is contributed to bowel cancer as well. Uh, and the more that we drink and the longer you've been drinking, the greater the risk. Um, and I know it, it, there has been talk over the time around red wine is um, healthy and, and that type of thing, but basically any alcohol increases your risk of cancer. Um, and so our message is really around limiting um, or avoiding alcohol where possible. Um, and in addition to that uh, or avoid or limit recommendation, we also talk about having no more than two standard drinks per day and including two alcohol-free days each week. And, and then it's, you know, talking to people about what tips can we do. So avoiding those binge drinking episodes, um, eating food while you drink, you know, alcohol is there to be shared and enjoyed um, over meals um, and, and thinking about alcohol, getting people to think about alcohol in in that way rather than um, in terms of uh, going to the pub just for some beers um, is a much easier way to look at reducing the alcohol consumption. Other ways is alternate, alternate, <laughs> alternating alcoholic drinks with non-alcoholic drinks. Um, and, you know, uh, put your hand up and be a designated driver. These are all ways that we can talk to people about how they could possibly um, find tools to reduce their alcohol consumption. Um, once they can identify that um, they realise that what amount that they're drinking um, is problematic in terms of cancer risk. And, and I guess some of the problem that we have here is that not many people actually um, think about alcohol and cancer being related. Uh, and so really encourage um, you to talk to clients around 
that there is a huge link between alcohol and cancer and bowel cancer um, so that we can start building that awareness um, for people so that they start um, finding it as a consideration or an, and a step or a reason why to, to cut back on their intake. And uh, finally, our last uh, uh, step in the six steps is be smoke free. Um, and Cancer Council is really proud um, to be operating um, Quitline. It's a government funded service um, operated through Cancer Council SA. Um, and you can call people on the phone 13 78 48 or via the Quitline web chat function. Um, and I'll include that into the mess uh, into the um, to the slides that you have those numbers available because um, it really is a fantastic resource um, providing support and strategies and information to helping um, people quit um, and helping them on their journey. And the quit line operators are, are really non-judgmental um, and, and are really great at what they do. So I'd encourage um, you to use that service um, or encourage people to to ring up on that service if they're uh, looking and or wanting to reduce their smoking. So uh, I guess we have a number of resources available to you that um, can help in terms of these prevention messages. So we, uh, earlier on in the slides, I was talking about eating a healthy diet um, and we've created a portion your plate guide, which is a tear off pad, which the front side looks like this. So you can see that half a plate of vegetables, quarter plate of carbohydrate foods, grainy preferably, and a quarter of a plate of lean meat or alternatives. Uh, and that's a, a really good representation for people to start thinking about how, how they can add more vegetables or how many vegetables they actually should be having on their plate um, at lunch and dinner time. Um, but we know that looking at this diagram doesn't do much for people they can't really sometimes it's really hard to work out what that would look like in an actual meal so on the reverse side we've given some healthy meal ideas so breakfast lunch dinner and snacks snack ideas um, and these the recipes for the meals um, on the on the back side are available on our website and then encouraging those people around those limit or avoid foods as well, including alcohol fits into that one. So that's a resource. I've, I've got a link into the slides that you can uh, go to to order if you would like to use or get gain access to these tear off pads. There's 50 sheets per pad um, and it's a nice square little shape that people can put on their fridge. We also have a high fiber meal plan available. Again, there's a link further down in the slides that you'll be able to access this with recipes, um, click through recipes that you can go on and, and get the recipes for the meals in there. So it's basically a week of high fiber eating and what it looks like. And it actually makes people realize that it's probably more achievable than what they think to boost their fiber intake. We also have a couple of other fiber resources. So some easy swaps, um, and that's something that may be a great handout to give to people. Um, and next of all, oh, sorry, and then I'm down onto the links now. So um, you'll be able to access um, those resources. Some you can uh, download immediately and others you need to order through Cancer Council SA um, and we can send them out to you. And that's all from me. Thank you, Nat, for that. I, I always think I'm doing really well with my diet until I listen to you speak. <laughs> and then I think I've got to start, you know, um, I'm not so sure. Um, are there any questions uh, that anyone has for Nat? Um, you can certainly write in the meeting chat um, box on the side or just unmute and see if, are there any questions that um, while well, Nat's here. You explained everything really well, Nat. No. Okay, well, thank you again for that, Nat. That was really um, interesting. Yeah. And I will now hand back over to Carissa to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Nat. Thank you, Nat, and thank you, Jill. So 
Our next speaker tonight is, is my pleasure to introduce one of the me regular members of our peer support network, Jacqueline Riviera from Wellbeing SA. And Jacqueline, we know from our interactions with her at previous network meetings, she's very passionate about supporting people from multicultural backgrounds. And so tonight she's going to share some of her experiences um, around so how we can better support and better look after people from multicultural backgrounds to participate in bowel cancer screening. And one of the stats that really stood out to me earlier this evening in Camilla's presentation was just that, you know, that, that huge disparity between people from non-English speaking backgrounds and their participation rates. You know, it was more in the 20s and 30% compared to sort of the, the late, mid 40%. So it is quite significant. Um, Jacqueline, I just encourage you to um, take over the reins for the presentation now. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Carissa. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yeah. you. And I'll just, yeah. we look forward to uh, you taking control of those slides. Thank Wonderful. You. Okay. So um, I've been working at a screening and innovation team for the last seven years. Um, before that, I used to work uh, for 13 years at Shine SA as a community health worker. And my passion is always been working with people from multicultural background because my heritage is from Chile. So I, I was born in Chile, speak Spanish, and my household is very multicultural. Got children born here, and my husband is from Mauritius, French. So. We are very cosmopolitan, multicultural uh, family. <laughs> so, um, and because of my upbringing and my experiences in settling to a new country, uh, I thought my passion and my uh, professional life will be better used working cross-culturally with uh, cult communities and, of course, mainstream communities as well. So today we're going to talk about uh, bowel screening um, and the issues that uh, uh, people from multicultural background may experience when they're having uh, cervical bowel screening or any screening. So I'm going to give you, a, a, first of all, a definition of, of what a refugee is, because you may get someone coming through your uh, GP services or um, health uh, area, and they may come from a refugee background. So we're going to look at definitions. So is uh, the usually people that are uh, well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular, uh, particular social group or political opinion. It's, it's outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable or owing to such fear, is, uh, is unwilling to avail himself or herself of the protection of that country. Uh, and this is the um, Refugee Convention. So Australia is one of the uh, members of that Refugee Convention. So we have refugees, of course, for many decades coming to Australia. And then we have asylum seekers, uh, someone who says uh, they are refugee, but whose claim has not been definitely evaluated. So at present, we also have quite a few asylum seekers in Australia. Uh, uh, wanting refugee status, so the um, uh, doing pipe, the looking at the paperwork, and of course the detain. And then we have migrants and immigrants. So usually are the people who are uh, being able to come and choose the country uh, to plan uh, another in order to find work or better living conditions. So my parents came here as migrants and not as refugees. So it was um, to have a better lifestyle for their children. Yeah. Um, and at present, we got, I think, one out of 10 households uh, that are from a cultural and linguistic diverse background. Okay, now I'm going to show you uh, the local areas where uh, m uh, people from cal background. We, I, I also uh, exchanged the word cal, cal cultural linguistic diverse background. The government at present are using that terminology uh, for people from countries where English is not spoken, but also we can use multicultural or ethnic background. Okay, so we got the three areas, uh, local areas that are high proportion of people from uh, cal background. 
we got play uh, source free so uh, council area uh, there's a lot of uh, newly arrived um, refugees asylum seekers migrant people living and sometimes that's due to the um, cheaper uh, housing uh, availability also playfair area and then comes port adelaide enfield prospect area you can also see sometimes uh, let's say if i go to um uh, Hanson Road, uh, um, there is a high proportion of Vietnamese. Um, so people tend to gra gravitate where the, uh, uh, the community have settled previously. So we got quite a lot of people in, uh, in the north from African background, uh, Burmese, Bhutanese. Yeah. We'll go to the next slide. Of course, you're going to have this for you to take a uh, Afterwards, Carissa will email you the presentation. In 2018, uh, 19, these are the groups uh, that were settling in South Australia uh, from Afghanistan, uh, second, and then Congo, Nepal, Syria, Bhutan, Pakistan, Malaysia, India, and Tanzania. A lot of these communities at present are living in the northern region. And we have quite quite a lot now coming from Iraq and Syria due to war, yeah, and settle. And now uh, the estimated resident population of the five countries at birth of birth in South Australia from the 30th of June, uh, 2016, uh, were mainly England, 104,000, India, 29,000, China, 27,000, Italy. 20,000 and Vietnam, 16,000. Uh, we're going to talk about what are the barriers and gaps identified um, regarding uh, migrants and refugee people, asylum seekers. Okay, so there's a lack of uh, information for, for from uh, people from a refugee and asylum seekers background about the Australian public health system and the referral pathway. So what it means that sometimes they don't know how to navigate the health system may be quite different to the way the health system was in the country of origin. So it may be a new health system. Um, the barriers also uh, that a refugee or migrant may experience people is the absence of bulk billing in GP services or for particularly asylum seekers, uh, waiving fees and also, uh, and also in rural areas where perhaps they have to pay uh, and there's no bulk billing, there's not much choice. Uh, they also may be experiencing ra racial discrimination and lack of cultural sensitivity. Sometimes when I work with the women, um, they say to me, you know, I visit these GP services and the doctor, uh, they don't tend to use interpreter. Um, and uh, um, Sometimes I have to bring my child, and I, I think that's very appalling uh, what is happening because uh, GP services have access to interpreters free, um, um, and also they put themselves in a in a very um, di in dilemma uh, ethically because that shouldn't be happening. Um, so sometimes I have to um, tell the lady that she has rights and she has right to uh, ask for interpreter um, and also I always try to say to her or him to double book double appointment so they have more time because of the complex issues they may need to raise with the doctor um, there's also uh, long waiting times in emergency department and in public hospitals and doctor surgery. We have to remember that people from multicultural background, they may not come from the similar systems as the westernized systems. Most of the people coming from cal background, they may be coming from war-torn countries uh, where perhaps the health system is not about prevention, it's about a reactive health system. I only go to the doctor when I'm sick. I'm not going there to prevent uh, cervical cancer or breast cancer or bowel cancer. And even in those countries, those tests may not even exist. Uh, so it's a new test for them all together. When I work with Congolese people, they, they have no idea what's a bowel screening test because they don't have that in their country. 
Um, so it's very important when we got people in front of us and they're uh, from CAL background to ask them, have you heard of this test before? Have you ever done this test? So you get a picture um, where what have they heard uh, from the test or if they have a test like that back in their country. Um, there is also a lack of access to specialist care, particularly with bilingual uh, uh, specialists or doctors um, and interpreters. Uh, that's another gap. Uh, sometimes, like I was saying to you, um, services providers don't use interpreters. They think, oh, this person got enough English, they seem to understand, will be all right. Or, yeah, bring your, doc bring your daughter or your son or your husband. Um, that's not proper to do because uh, conversation should be a bit confidential, particularly for also women who may be experiencing domestic violence. OK, so considering when working with cult clients, um, trauma, they, as I mentioned to you, when I work with women from uh, Syrian, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, uh, these are women, African women, they're coming from war-torn countries where there's been a lot of social unrest, a lot of um, uh, odd atro atrocities they may have witnessed. So bilingual screening may not be their priority. Uh, relation to authority, um, they may be a bit hesitant uh, with police or with the government institutions because sometimes those governments are institutions have been uh, perpetrators of oppression back in their countries. So we have to develop trust. Um, health history, experience of health care and systems. Um, like the example I gave you previously about the lady that lives in the north. I won't mention the service provider because I already rang up, but um, they, they have a high proportion of cow uh, people in that particular area and, and GPs or nurse practitioners or um, uh, receptionists are not being cross-culturally sensitive or aware how to provide services for people from cow background. Um, there is also oppression, uh, racism, stereotyping, biases, and prejudice. Uh, sometimes um, uh, the way we communicate to people from cal background um, or the way we perceive someone because they look different or because they dress different or because they have an accent, we may uh, uh, have a stereotype uh, 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 biases uh, because they don't look the same or they they don't behave the, the way we think they should behave. So uh, the people uh, from Cal background my, and my own personal experience is that um, there is uh, institutional racism in, in services provision at times and that needs to change. Inclusivity and client work approaches of client center. So we need to remember that people from cal background, particularly people coming from poorer countries, uh, we coming from a communal setting. My family, uh, um, when I talk about my health, at times I need to include my family. We're not coming from an individualistic perspective. We're coming from a communal perspective. So the way we provide the services, at times we have to include the family uh, that uh, that person is coming from uh, to see the doctor, the discussions. Um, we may have to modify work approaches to suit client needs. So like like if I know that a client English is not their first language, um, I may ask them, would, uh, I don't seem to, we don't seem to understand each other. I, I can uh, understand what you're saying. You can understand what I'm saying. It's best that we use an interpreter and we use the telephone. 
So, uh, so what that what it means then maybe I have to use more time with our clients, not just ten minutes, but be, perhaps use double booking appointment. Uh, the other problems uh, or barriers uh, is for under screen of uh, people from cal background as camilla showed you uh, is only what 20 20 percent instead of 46 percent people from cal background uh, don't do the test so of course the language barrier a lot of our resources are in english and if we don't take the time to get information in another language, that's going to be an issue for the person to do a bowel screening or if we're not sitting down and showing them with the pamphlet about how to do the test and not using interpreters. Lack of access of interpreters. So um, uh, some uh, the interpreter on the phone is an excellent services because it's a national line. So there may be an interpreter that not necessarily from South Australia, they may be from Victoria. So that's the beauty of it. There is no face to face and it's all confidential. Uh, the other barrier is short GP appointments. Um, when I take my mother, uh, she's an elderly lady, used to take my mother to the GP, I will always make sure she has a double appointment uh, because then the doctor is able to explain uh, things uh, that she need he, he needs to address with more time, um, and she's also able to ask questions with an assistant of an interpreter, uh, because having a conversation with three people translating uh, takes more time, and also so the client understand what they need to do regarding the uh, care, uh, health health treatment or care. Uh, and is unable to ask questions. Uh, the, some services is not about billing, so that's a barrier as well, but particularly people uh, from refugee background, employment level is low compared to mainstream, so they may not see the doctor because they may not have the money uh, to go and see the doctor. Um, so bulk billing is important um, to provide uh, in, in low socioeconomical areas and the cost. Lack of awareness of the test. If, I work, if I'm working with Bhutanese people or Burmese people, most of these people, they don't understand what's the bowel test about because they don't have this in their country of origin. Um, so it's a new test. So we need to explain to them, we need to show pictures. Um, fear and shame of doing the test. So, you know, it could be, well, if I found bowel cancer, um, it's going to be a problem because I don't want to deal with it. Um, people may not want to r relate with to me because I've got this this disease that I didn't want to have, and also taboo and a stigma because maybe in the country of origin this cancer is uh, that I, it happened because I did something wrong in life, or it's a punishment, or or it. It's, uh, it's considered that, you know, it's, it's evil. So um, there is also um, the assistant uh, and the benefits of the test in their language, maybe they don't understand. Uh, and the lack of uh, sufficient bicultural healthcare providers, GPs or, or nurses that are not uh, uh, they don't go because the doctor doesn't speak the language or, or the nurse either, so they don't feel confident in going to see the GP. How to increase the uh, participation when it comes to bowel screening? So again, greater access to interpreter services, and I cannot uh, encourage you uh, uh, to access those services, even though if the client said, no, it's okay, I can manage because I have, I think you have, everyone has a duty of care regarding the care of the person and, and language um, can break down many barriers. So um, use the interpreting services, greater promotion of a screening in health services and its benefits, um, particularly explaining the power screening test 
uh, because remember, we this is prevention. The test is a preventative to prevent cancer. We come in from countries where people prevention doesn't exist. I just go to the doctor when I'm sick. Uh, access to resources uh, using the national bowel screening call languages and posters in your waiting rooms. Sometimes I go to GP areas and I see very little uh, bicultural, bilingual resources in the waiting room. Uh, but again, it, it depends as well on the where the doctor is located. If, uh, if, if, you know, if you're providing services in the north, please provide leaflets in different language because it's a large proportion in South Fair area. Uh, Playfair area and, and the western region. Now in the south, there is high proportion of people from Middle Eastern and from uh, South America. And there's quite a lot of resources in the na national bowel screening. Um, employ more bilingual staff. Um, I've been doing some research about bilingual staff in GP services, and it's amazing that I get amazed because I see doctors uh, where in their website, you know, they give a little bit of history of their work, a uh, professional uh, where they have work, what, what they specialize in. And at times there is lack of um, information whether the doctor is bilingual and what language they speak. Um, it's in, very important to promote this because having a language is an asset, it's not a deficit. And if you got doctors that uh, are bilingual, believe me, uh, CAL communities will access your services. And it's more beneficial as well for your GP practice and your and your CAL client that you don't you not there is no need to use interpreter. You're speaking the language that you speak. Uh, also long long appointments and not uh, with bulk billing. That's a, that's a benefit. For, for the client from CAL background because um, money is an issue. And also to explain sometimes they have complex issues, they have chronic illness, so they need longer appointments. 10 minutes is not enough for a CAL client. Provide education and information about prevention of bowel cancer, um, particularly for people before they turn 50 to start introducing them the National Bowel Kit so they get to see it, they get to uh, see the pictures, they get to understand how the test is done. Um, and also there's lots of resources in the National Bowel Screening uh, regarding bowel, bowel prevention of bowel cancer and how to do the test. So download that information and have it in your uh, computer. Uh, health practitioner need to assist CAL client to access and complete screening forms where possible. Last, a few months ago, I was doing a session on bowel screening and I did it with uh, but, uh, Nepalese in the north uh, for with people for, from 50 and over. Uh, when I asked them to put their hands up, I had about 30 participants in the group, men and women. Uh, and I asked them to put their hands up. I asked them, had they done the test? Um, some said yes, they got the kit. And I asked them what happened to the kit. They say, I've got it, but I don't know how to do it. What do I need to do with the, with the forms? What do I need to complete? Then I ask, who hasn't done the test? They put their hand up. Uh, and when I ran the health, the national bowel screening uh, uh, program, I asked them to please send me the information in uh, ne Nepalese. Uh, I was told uh, they have to download the information because they cannot do it. I advocated and I said, you need to do it because these people don't have access to a computer. They don't understand and cannot read English. So please send them the information about the test in the Nepalese language. Now, if you say that to an English person, 
they will understand what they require to do. Now, if this work I hadn't ex I invited me to run this session, if I didn't take the time to ring the national bowel screening, if I didn't take the time to sit down with the people that brought the kid and had the form but didn't know how to do, I'm sure these people will be the 20% that you see in the screen that hadn't done the test. So it's what I'm trying to say that if we're going to be saying to a person, uh, do the test from CAL background, and we ask them how long they've been in Australia, and they haven't been here very long, and their English is not very good, help them to complete the form, guide them, navigate them, how to do the test, so we prevent bowel cancer. We save in a life. So it's very important that we explain the procedure of how to do the test, and if possible, get the information in their language. If they're not, if they're illiterate in their own language, let's say if I'm talking to women from Afghanistan background, these women, have, some of them have never been to school, they're illiterate in their own language, in their country, because of political reasons and religious reasons, they may not be able to complete the form. So we need to help them to complete the forms. Uh, train staff on, on cultural sensitivity and cross-cultural awareness. So it's very important because uh, if a client uh, finds themselves that that services is racist, that those workers that they are, the prejudice, they're not going to access that services again. And believe me, they will tell people in the community, don't go to that center because they're not very nice. Where it gets around the community. Also increase staff awareness of CAL specific welfare services. So if we are working with communities that you never have worked with, uh, in the slide, I'm going to provide you with services uh, that work with multicultural communities, and they're always happy to talk to health service providers, supporting them to do the best they can do. Um, and the resources, so you got the clinic resources that I was talking to you about. Um, um, sorry. Uh, now I'm lost. Uh, how do we go back? Uh, sorry, how do we go back? That's okay, Jacqueline. I'll, yeah? I'll I'll get the presentation up again. Okay. Uh, we're just conscious of time, yeah. so if we've just got um, you know, perhaps one more key point to make yeah. before we finish. Yeah. Just put this slide back uh, if you don't mind. Uh, sorry, my technology with me is a bit funny. <laughs> It will just take me a moment to get back Thank to where you. we were up to. Thank okay. You. Almost yeah. finished now. Yeah. Okay, I think we, uh, yeah, I think we, co we cover that in the resources. Okay, so there are where it says access cl clinical resources. They are the ones that they got uh, in, in different language. Yeah, cancer screening, go. It's excellent resources as well. Uh, and of course, the interpreting services that doctors and nurse practitioners have access to and also call people multicultural people and of course here our screening and innovation team. I work Monday to Friday and um, Monday to Wednesday, sorry, Camila works Monday to Friday so you can 
give us a call and, and talk to us if you wish. Uh, and also Cancer Council, they've got very good resources. Um, particularly if you know people have bowel cancer, please refer them to Cancer Council because it's an excellent support services uh, and assist them navigating their ca cancer journey. Information regarding CAL Communities, Multicultural Community Council, it's an umbrella organization uh, that has many ethnic communities connected to these services. Uh, and they work uh, for and with multicultural communities uh, and, of course, mainstream services. And also Australian Refugee Association, they have offices in the north and west, and they mainly uh, work with refugees and asylum seekers, and, uh, and it's a very good services, and they provide cross-cultural training for uh, organisations and health professionals. And I also can assist you also regarding how to make your services more cross-cultural friendly. So I'm happy to come and visit and, and discuss with you uh, regarding how to make it uh, a good services for multicultural uh, communities and maybe process and procedures you need to put in place. Uh, and also, of course, refugee health services. That's so Jan Williams is a nurse practitioner who works with refugee health services. She's an excellent uh, nurse practitioner. I'm sure you know her, some of you. And uh, she works, her role is mainly working with refugees uh, when they come into, settling into South Australia. Um, so they screen and they provide them health support the first year. And then they refer them to mainstream doctors, their clients. Okay, that's about it. If you got uh, any questions um, and this is how see, see how I put thank you gracias uh, bon, uh, gracias uh, these are a post that you can do in your services and put them in your uh, waiting room uh, welcoming people from different nationalities muchas thank gracias you, Jackie. That yeah, that's it. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Jackie. That was um, fascinating um, and really important that we remember that, you know, education, communication and understanding is really important um, for all clients, particularly um, for call clients. Um, I think we might hold question time just for um, Jackie, if that's all right. Is, is anyone got a burning question? No, otherwise I think uh, due to time we might move on. But as I said, thank you, Jackie, that was really wonderful. So I'll hand over to you, Carissa, to um, introduce our final speaker. Merci beaucoup, Jacqueline, and thank you so much, Jill. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our final guest speaker for this evening, my colleague Nora. Nora is an Aboriginal Programs Project Officer here at Cancer Council SA. And she's got a lovely project she's working on, which has been kindly funded by the Adelaide PHN. And so Nora's going to take over the reins now and just share a little bit about her work in supporting Aboriginal people to participate in bowel cancer screening. So Nora, I invite you to take the reins, take control of the presentation, and it is yours. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. And hello, everybody. A <laughs> um, little nervous because I haven't had a pre done a presentation uh, for quite a while. So forgive me if I speak really fast and it sounds like I have a machine gun pointed at my head. But anyway, um, firstly, I just want to um, also acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional custodians, the Ghana people on whose lands that we are meeting on, upon today. Um, and I'd also like to pay respects to um, um, pay respects to any of the um, any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be listening in um, while I'm doing this presentation. Um, just firstly, uh, just as Chris have mentioned, um, I'm the Aboriginal Programs Project Officer, and I have been with Cancer Council since um, the end of October. Um, prior to that, Nathan Rigney, who was the coordinator of this program, um, sort of pulled everything together prior to me coming on um, later in the year. So this program has been around since um, February of 2018, and we've just sort of just followed it on from um, Nathan leaving at the in July of last year. Um, just a little bit um, to let you know where I come from, I suppose. So uh, Carissa was kind enough to add 
back um, the um, map of Australia. I just want to um, pay respects to where I come from. I'm a Central Aranda person, but um, which is right up in the middle of um, the uh, map, which is um, around Alice Springs, or I'm from Alice Springs. So Central Aranda, and I've got also um, acknowledged Southern Aranda, my grandfather, and my grandmother, who was also a Yawada, who was up around the Tennant Creek area. Um, so I've got to pay respects to those um, people as well. Um, the Yarning Circles Aboriginal Cancer, uh, cancer sorry, Aboriginal Cancer Screening Program. Um, it was a, like uh, Chris mentioned, was a funded program by the Primary Health Network, and there was an idea that um, not enough Aboriginal people were being screened. Uh, obviously nationally, the, the levels were pretty low. Um, this program is actually um, metro based at this stage. It's a pilot project. Um, and we were sort of just seeing how this goes to actually roll it out, hopefully in the future, if it was a success. Um, at the moment, um, like, We've got ambassadors, and I'll go on to those ambassadors shortly, and stakeholders. The stakeholders were um, had come together uh, just to really provide support to the ambassadors and um, also the program to actually um, provide pathways to screening um, and also um, just to normalise conversations around cancer screening and just allaying um, or addressing the myths and the fears around cancer for Aboriginal people. Um, I just listening to um, Jacqueline's presentation, there's a lot of similarities with um, just the um, why low screening rates are in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. And just some of those are the shame factor around having to, um, I suppose, do a test or even just the uh, the doing your own bowel screening test um, is just that, like I said, that shame factor around that, I suppose. Um, there's also the language barrier, even though majority of um, Aboriginal people who um, live in Adelaide um, speak English, um, we have um, the um, we have a lot of Aboriginal people that, um, you know, their languages are either their second or third language. So we've got people up in the far north of South Australia, as well as over in the west of South Australia, that, um, you know, um, English is their second or third or even sometimes fourth language. Um, there's also that fear um, around being um, having tests. Um, in the past, if someone had gotten cancer, um, you know, um, it was like, oh, you, you know, you're going to die from this. So a lot of the generations that we're testing for, the 50 and over, um, there is still that um, fear of, um, you know, this has happened to a family member. Um, it's not talked about much um, in the community. So people are really sort of nervous about how, um, what, what the outcomes would be if they went and did this test. Um, there's also that lack of support. Um, there's a the history of lack of support within um, organisations um, for um, not just Aboriginal people, but like what um, Jacqueline, Jacqueline mentioned about our called community. Um, there is also that um, issue around, I suppose, institutional racism, that lack of support. Um, just also, the, one of the issues was that a lot of people, um, um, it wasn't mentioned, I don't think, um, the homelessness, people are, you know, living on the streets. Um, and also, I, I just know people who live out in bush communities, um, this is, um, they don't have fridges, so there's nowhere to store um, a bowel sample for that, um, in that example. So um, that lack of support in that sense. So that's why these yarning circles um, originated, um, just to um, support people through those processes. Um, we've got 12, 12 ambassadors um, who were recruited um, during the time from um, prior to my coming on board to now. We had four when I first started. We've now got 12 ambassadors and um, we've got three men, um, which was really good because it was really hard to actually recruit any men, male ambassadors to uh, promote the service. Um, but we've also had a lot... Uh, sorry, the 12 ambassadors we had have, have had experience either personally or um, with their family with the cancer journey. Um, and we've also had um, one person that um, her own family members, a brother and a sister, passed away from, from bowel cancer. And she's now one of our ambassadors who's promoting the Bowel Cancer Month, um, Janice Rigney. 
and she st sh uh, shared her story, as well as Ned Kulmatry, who he's also a cancer survivor as well, um, and just you know promoting that um, the importance of screening, I suppose, in in the community. Um, just going back two steps, these ambassadors um, are actually have been sort of trained up, and we've got a facilitator manual that has actually been. Um, uh, put together to to support these ambassadors to promote yarning circles in the community. Um, we um, also not just provide um, support for um, or yarning circles for bowel cancer sc uh, screening, but also the breast cancer um, and also um, cervical cancer or women's well women's checks um, for Aboriginal women as well. So um, our project is probably a little bit more diverse than than specifically bowel. But obviously, this is um, you know one of the important parts of um, our ambassadors presenting their yarning circles. So the role of the ambassador is, like I mentioned, they facilitate yarning circles in the community. Um, they're trained up, and I provide support. We um, provide in support in that I um, am the one that helps facilitate the yarning circles in getting the um, venues together um, and participants. I um, uh, support the ambassadors in um, uh, bringing resources together um, to give to our participants on the day. Once I have all that stuff done, the um, ambassadors take over the facilitation of of the um, the yarning circle. Um, and the aim is like to promote the service to any Aboriginal person in the metro area. Um, so, you know, it could be like not just community, obviously community. These people are attached, have big families and they come from um, Adelaide and um, South Australia. So they have the connections out there. They're elders of the community. So they've had that experience, like I said, personally um, um, with, with cancer themselves or their family members. Um, and they've also been through all of these procedures, the tests, um, like the bowel screening and the, the mammograms and also the women's checks. So they, they could, they're experts in those areas to tell people or to share their experience with people, um, you know, and like I said, not just the community, but their own family um, and the importance of screening. Um, during the, uh, the yarning circles, we get um, feedback from um, the participants and um, we also provide that support to encourage screening for any cancers, not just the three main ones that I've mentioned. Right, our stakeholders are um, a number and they're really supportive of the project. So the ones that we have are SA Health Services. We have Breast Screen SA, um, who provide support with the mammograms, obviously. We've got Aboriginal Well Women's Screening Program. Then we've got the Pre Prevention and Population Health, who's uh, Camilla and Megan have provided support and Julie Patterson previously um, around bowel screening and also just um, providing support with their one-stop screening shops that they've had in recent months. Um, we've also got um, one Aboriginal network called Wado Peruna. Um, they an, um, are an umbrella organisation of SA Health, but they have three Aboriginal family clinics that come under them, and they are Wanganga Turt Pandy, who is at Port Adelaide, um, Manapiendi at um, Elizabeth, and Moringa Turt Pandy, who are based at Hillcrest. And all of those um, services, like I said, we've run yarning circles through um, each of those, and they provide support um, in, in as a practical um, context, I suppose. We also have Aboriginal Family Clinic based at um, Norlunga, and they also have a, another smaller clinic at Clavelli Park. We also have Nankawaran Yonti, um, who is based in the city. They're an Aboriginal community controlled health service. They also have a um, um, clinic out at uh, Brady Street, out at um, Davron Park. And we've also run yarning circles through Nankawaran Yonti with a big success um, there as well. Um, and the last but not least stakeholder is Sonda with our Close the Gap team. Um, they're the people that actually get the clients to, you know, to come to these support clients and getting, coming into the yarning circles and, um, and also promoting, um, supporting them on their screening, I suppose. Um, the role of the stakeholders, like I said, um, is to promote the, our service um, and our yarning circles to their clients and the community. 
um, to also support on screening pathways, such as potential screening days. And like I mentioned at Nakwanyanti, we had a Well Women's Day where we had breast screen um, and we took women off to have mammograms. And I think we had 18 participants on that day and we had uh, um, 18 women that were screened. So that had been a proven success that um, women or people coming together and just and yarning about it, that opportunity is there also. Um, and back on um, the um, bowel screening side of it, um, our Aboriginal clinics at uh, Port Adelaide, um, Elizabeth and um, Hillcrest, they also provide pickup and um, storage, I suppose, of um, clients' samples for bowel screening. Um, they can support that client in rather than keeping it in their fridge. If they don't have a fridge, they'll store that until all the kit's done and then they can send it off. They actually can send that off for um, individual clients as well. Um, and that's been a proven success as far as I know in just getting people to be screened as well. Um, they also provide the facilities and also, like I said, participants for yarning circles. So, um, so far we've had a pretty successful rate in um, feedback from um, the participants in saying that um, listening to um, the um, ambassadors talking about their experiences give them more um, confidence in um, being screened um, and going on and like seeing a lot of those people there in their late um, early sorry, um, in, in, well into their 70s or late 70s and um, they want to live to be that um, that old as well because obviously you're aware that um, the mortality rate for Aboriginal people is um, 25 years less than, um, I may be wrong there, it's 17 years less than non-Aboriginal people. Forgive me if I've just given you the wrong information. <laughs> Um, I suppose mine's a bit quick. This is, these are just some of the um, photos of some of our yarning circle groups. Um, we've had sort of some of the, it, it depends on what they want. We have mixed ones where an ambassador will speak to a mixture of men and women. Um, and then we have um, opportunities for gender specific, like I said, men only or women only. Um, so it really just depends on um, the group themselves on where they want to go and the people that um, other organisations who have actually um, provided support with venues and stuff where they think that they might be, a, you know, prefer to do just a men's only or a women's only. So we're um, very open to any, what anyone um, would prefer. Um, and like a, we've just received, um, I don't know whether you can see on one of the screens, we've got pull up um, a couple of pull up banners, which are sort of our logos around the seven ways to reduce cancer risk and also around um, asking about cancer screening and what the um, yearly or the two yearly, the bowel cancer, sorry, is two years, breast cancer is two years and well women's checks are five, every five years. Um, so um, the, like I said, the feedback has been pretty positive so far. Um, and um, before uh, COVID came about, we were sort of on target to um, really smash the yarning circles out of the park, but obviously um, that hasn't happened now. So we have to get, go back a, a little bit to the drawing board and, um, you know, refocus how we're going to do that, um, you know, to, to promote these screening services again. Um, like I said, it's um, this is a, just a metro um, program and it's a pilot program. So we hope with a bit of luck this might grow, um, you know, in the future because obviously there is a need not just here in um, South Australia but also across the um, across Australia as well. Um, you'll see some of the resources. These are, uh, resources are available on that website. Um, and if if you um, if you want to know a bit more information or you want to have a yarning circle, um, we've done some through medical services as well. Um, then you know more than happy to um, for you to make contact um, and we could go from there I suppose if you want to have a conversation or get some more information um, and I think that might be it <laughs> yes so thank you and so, sorry for again for so, speaking so fast <laughs> Thank you, Nora, for that. That was really interesting. It's wonderful to know that all those services are out there um, and we just need to keep utilising them. Uh, and the screening program sounds fantastic, the yarning circles. Um, are there any questions for Nora uh, before I hand back over to Carissa? 
please put it down the chat uh, box if you'd like to. Otherwise, just come off your, um, your mute. Very quiet audience tonight, Carissa. I'll see if you can wrap them up. So I'll say good night and hand you back to Carissa. Thank you, Jill. And I did type in the comment box. Um, so two of the ambassadors Nora mentioned were Ned and Janice sharing about their experiences. And you can actually read about them on the Cancer Council SA Bowel Cancer Awareness webpage at the moment. I actually had a, a good read of them myself and I, I highly recommend they're a powerful read. Um, there's lots of amazing resources also that you can find on that bowel cancer landing page. So, yeah, I can send through that link um, when I send through the notes. But thank you so much, Nora, um, for, for that overview. It was really wonderful just to hear about the work you've been doing. And uh, even though COVID's gotten in the way, it's great to hear that tenacity of going back to the drawing board and seeing what else you can do to keep that work going. So thank you so much. Well, that brings us to a wrap with our four presenters tonight. We've done amazingly well. And uh, tomorrow I'll send out an evaluation tool, an online survey, just via SurveyMonkey. And you're more than welcome. Uh, it takes less than two minutes to complete. But just to provide some feedback on our speakers tonight and how you found the session. And uh, you might also, while you're there, put this date in your diary, save the date for October 14. And that will be our final instalment of the Peer Support Network for this year. We're hoping it will be face-to-face -face next time round. And uh, the topic um, which has come up has been an update on lymphedema, which um, is quite an interesting one in terms of new technology that's available and um, some of the um, new information, new updates in terms of access of, of garments um, and hopefully we'll get someone, um, a really dy dynamo speaker, just to share about their personal experiences and advocacy as well. So my lovely colleague, Jill Miller, will be coordinating and hosting that event as I'll be going on maternity leave. Now we've come to the great time of the night, which is networking. And I can see we've got enough time to give everyone a good solid minute and a half up to two minutes just to share a little bit about the work that you're doing because usually we would do this face to face and it's a lot more easier to sort of you know have a yarn with each other when we're sitting alongside each other but because we're doing this virtual tonight what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to run through our participant list and if you'd like to share just a little bit about your your current work that you're doing any particular resources you want to share any projects you're working on that are relevant to this topic tonight or um, just want to share a little bit more about just your interest in the topic or what you found most valuable tonight, um, I'm going to hand the microphone over to you. When I hand it over to you, you're more than welcome to put your video on and please unmute yourself. Uh, not everyone has video, I understand that, um, but at least you're welcome to unmute yourself and just share um, a little bit about, um, yeah, your services and what you're up to. And this is your chance to shine. Now, tonight, I'm actually going to start with um, now Clayton. I know you didn't have a microphone last time, but given that you're from Adelaide PHN, I'm going to hand over to you first, Clayton. No worries. Thanks, Carissa. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so last time I actually uh, broke my headset, um, but have since replaced it, so happy to uh, participate now. <coughs> um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a practice facilitator at the Adelaide Primary Health Network. Um, I'm usually working with general practice, so going out uh, physically on site um, and usually doing a lot of work around quality improvement, um, as well as, you know, typically pushing uh, whatever, you know, sort of in, uh, uh, project or program the Commonwealth has, uh, you know, asked us to do. Um, I was asked to manage the peer support network grants um, for the Cancer Council, which has been fantastic. The um, sessions to date have been uh, incredible. Um, and you know, I think the presenters tonight have all done uh, a really outstanding job. Um, and even yourself, Chris, are in um, organising and managing this. You've been outstanding as well. Um, as someone who went into this Totally unassuming. Um, I've been absolutely blown away with the content um, and it's been a seriously eye-opening experience. Um, I don't have much else. Like I said, totally unassuming. I'm more or less a lay person 
in this sort of space. Um, so it's just, it, it's been a massive, uh, uh, really, really good learning experience for me, actually. So I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Clayton. And that was very sweet. Thank you for the oh, comment. Oh, that's okay. No um, I wondered if you just wanted to share anything else just around the PenCat tool and just yeah, how, because I know you've yep. got some workshops I saw in your PHN newsletter. Uh, <laughs> yes, they are coming up. Uh, you, put, you put me on the spot here. Sorry. Um, with the dates and stuff. That's all right. I should have uh, had some stuff ready. Um, um, but yeah, so I'm not sure how many of us are working in general practice, I would assume. There are quite a few on the line. Yeah. Majority, yep. Um, so the PHN does actually subsidise um, PenCS for general practice, which is a uh, data extraction tool. So um, it pulls your data out of your clinical software, so best practice, uh, ZMED, you know, medical director, whatever it might be, um, and puts it into a usable format. Um, and that is actually a really powerful way to be um, looking into what's happening within your practice um, and backing that up with data. So we are actually running some workshops around that uh, in the coming month or so. I will need to uh, I'll need to confirm all this, um, but do please get on our website and have a look at upcoming training and events. Uh, on this section there and by all means please do register and come along if you are interested in learning um, a how to use that tool um, and perhaps b before that you might uh, even just be asking your practice owners or practice manager if the practice does already have pen cs which i i think most practices in adelaide do so if you want to come along and learn how to use that um yeah you're you're all more than welcome Thank I you, Clayton. No worries. Yeah, I'll, um, no, it's lovely. Thank I'll see you. if I can get the, uh, the the flyer for that to, to, to disseminate um, to this group. Yeah, otherwise I'm happy to circulate the newsletter again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> lovely. Now, no Jane, do we still have Jane Forster on the line from Woodville Medical? No. Okay, we'll move on from Jane. Um, Marie. Oh, no, Jane is there. Sorry, Jane. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. I was fiddling with the iPad at the time as you called me. No, that's okay. Oh, now, did you're you welcome get my to... message? I didn't, no. Oh, okay. First off, did I hear correctly? Did I hear maternity leave? Yes, you did. <laughs> oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you for another good evening. It was very enjoyable. It's good to hear everybody talking, so it's all good. And did you want to share anything, an update from your practice? So you're at Woodville? Nah, I'm family. at Woodville Medical Practice, been yep. there for too long, been doing practice nursing for the last 32 years. So, um, yeah, other than the fact that we're moving, we've got a brand new surgery being built. Oh, that's um, exciting. It is, yes. We move in on the beginning of August, so that's exciting. But otherwise, no, it's just... You know, another day, another dollar. It's Will very it still good. be in the same area? Yes, it's. we've gone from uh, Woodville Road to Port Road, that's all. Okay. Um, but, yes, great big place, two treatment rooms and, I don't know, 14 other rooms and, yeah, a big improvement on what we're in now anyhow. So, yeah, that's oh, about that's, it. That's fantastic. Well, all the best with the move and the relocation. Thank you. I hope that goes smoothly for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, thank you for tonight. It was very enjoyable. And I dare say we'll catch up in the very near future. Wonderful. Thank you, Jane. I look forward to thank it. You. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Um, Marie-Louise. Hi. Hang on. I'll just do that. Camera. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to say congratulations to Carissa. That's thank lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, no, it's very good presentation. And I must admit, I've noticed the last few times how you mentioned processed meat, which I think is great because it's actually now in mainstream. Before it was like, oh yeah, only very alternative people sort of didn't eat that kind of thing. People that were doing their own diets, but you know, I just think it's great that it's all been researched now. And um, yeah, and I have a personal interest in this kind of because it's in my family. Well, my sister had it, so yeah, it's really good. Yeah, and then professionally, just for those of you that are joining us, if you're wondering, um, do you want to share what you do as an occupation and where you're based? 
Well, I'm a chiropractor and my patients are very well behaved. They go and have their screens. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, all the best. Um, yes. Moving along. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Ruth Jarman. So this is Ruth's first time joining us tonight. Ruth, do you want to just share, um, again, your profession and where you're based and just any sort of, yeah, updates or anything you'd like to share with the group tonight? Yeah, thank, thanks for that. I found tonight really interesting, a lot of great information and a lot of great resources to follow up on. I'm a new psychologist. I'm going to be working with cancer patients from the Flinders Private Hospital. So I did my last placement at the Cancer Centre at the Flinders Medical Centre and I'm continuing on in that vein. So thanks again for tonight. Oh, you're welcome, Ruth. And just wish you all the best as you settle into your new role as well and put all those professional skills into practice. Thank you. We look forward to staying in touch. Beautiful. Um, now, Russ, I have never met you before, Russ. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Would you like to share a little bit about uh, where you're based, Russ, and what you're up to and just any updates on tonight? Hi, I'm um, sorry. It's actually Melinda Kelly here. I'm just on Thank my you, Melinda. I was so confused. <laughs> I was going to write a message early, but I thought I'll just email you. So, yes, um, it is Melinda on my husband's computer. Um, so I'm Lyft from Lyft Cancer Care Services. Um, so I'm a physiotherapist there, um, mainly working with patients um, for exercise medicine. Um, so, yeah, it was really good information um, tonight just to, I guess, that we can utilise with the patients in the gym and letting them know about how important, well, how much more important a healthy lifestyle is for the prevention um, as well as the treatment. And I'm so relieved, Melinda, because when you said you could join us tonight and I didn't see your name on the list, I thought, <laughs> oh, no, she's been blocked out. I'll have to follow up. So I'm so Sorry. relieved. <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> No, no, we're so glad you're able to join us. And um, also, like with our next topic um, being an update on lymphedema, one thing that you do have at Lift Cancer Care Services, which I spotted in your gym, is this um, amazing looking device. Did you want to share anything about it? Yeah, yeah. So um, the Sozo is what it's called. Um, and essentially, um, it's early detection for lymphedema. So um, we get patients on, ideally, we like to see them before surgery, um, but in most cases, we don't see them until afterwards. Um, so we just, um, they basically just stand on, it kind of looks like a scale, I guess. Um, so they stand on some plates with bare feet, bare hands, um, and it measures the fluid in either um, limb um, and compares it to the other. So it can see um, if they're at risk of lymphedema or if they have lymphedema. Um, so ideally, we can treat it um, as early as possible. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, yeah, I'm thinking, oh, Jill, make note of that one. We might want to do a bit of show and tell at our next network meeting. <laughs> yes, I've actually been down to Lyft and it's wonderful down there and I've seen that little machine as well. Um, so it's very useful. Beautiful. Like share it. Um, while I've got you here, Jill, do you want to just give an update about what you've been up to and it's on behalf of Cancer Council SA? Oh, thanks, Carissa. Um, so my role, at, uh, my name's Jill and my role at Cancer Council is a health engagement officer and I really look, um, engage with uh, health professionals, uh, with clinicians and people that work directly in the hospital systems um, in supportive care for people affected by cancer. Um, so Carissa sort of works with the people in primary health and I deal with the people in the clinical settings in the hospitals. Um, so I really enjoy that and I enjoy hearing what's happening um, in the prevention side of things. Um, and I think it's also um, important just to make um, comment on the um, 13 11 20 number for information and support uh, where we have our um, uh, professional cancer nurses that sit on the line there and they'll answer any questions that anyone has about cancer. So for any of your clients, um, people in your care, you think they need some uh, some help in the supportive care area, um, please uh, get them to ring the nurses on 13 11 20. 
And when talking about called people, we certainly use interpreter services for all um, our services in the supportive care area. So uh, please remember that number. It's kind of the gateway to all our services. Uh, but I also enjoyed listening to tonight and I enjoy taking over the reins while Chris looks, looks after that baby and uh, we'll welcome her back next year. Um, thanks, Carissa. Thank you, Jill. And um, Sue. Sorry. Hi. That's okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sue? Yes. Um, yeah, so as uh, Cam said, I um, work on the bowel cancer screening program and deal um, work with the Commonwealth. Um, the Commonwealth um, government is responsible for um, basically running the whole program, sending out the kits and managing the register and um, doing all the follow up. Um, but I um, also liaise with um, another group within SA Health that deals with the uh, colonoscopy services, um, which can become quite tricky with the waiting list. So we get information from them um, about how the waiting lists are going. Um, um, uh, which is during COVID-19, of course, they shut down the elective surgery for a while and that's just starting to um, ramp back up again. Um, and I also work with another group that Cam mentioned, which was the participant follow-up function officers, who um, each state is funded by the Commonwealth to have these officers based um, within the state that follow up the people that haven't um, gone to a GP or haven't then gone to a specialist for a follow-up test um, following their positive um, uh, faecal occult blood test result. Um, and I also do a little bit of work with an organisation you mightn't have heard of, um, the No Australians Dying of Bowel Cancer Initiative based at SAMRI. Um, they do a lot of um, research work um, into bowel cancer and I think they work with the PHNs as well. Um, on some projects and we meet regularly with um, Carol Holden from that group um, and there's other groups as well that we meet with but uh, they're the main ones that I've mentioned. Happy yeah. to answer any questions anyone has. Hey Sue, it's Cam here. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I was just trying to remember the story that um, the national program was saying about um, what, what trend in, had happened during COVID with bowel cancer screening? Because I know some of the screening programs have experienced a real drop, not just breast cancer that shut down, but even cervical, which um, wasn't necessarily paused at all, but people have sort of voluntarily dropped off. Do you, off the top of your head, remember if people are still screening, have been screening at the same rate? Or um, My understanding is that um, the sonic which is the laboratory that processes the kits, have um, told the Commonwealth that they've had an increase in kit returns because right. they think because <laughs> people are sitting at home and they've got <laughs> nothing else to do, so they pull out their kit out of the drawer and get on with it. Um, so, yeah, as far as I'm yeah. aware, it um, sounds like the numbers have gone up in Excellent. the last few months. Yeah. And yet, and yet, yeah, we, we do need to make sure that people are still attending their follow-up appointments because I think definitely in, in cervical um, there's that. There's been actually a voluntary drop-off, so people have been cancelling their follow-up um, procedures voluntarily. Um, so it's not entirely the fault of the um, elective procedures. but And I think there's anecdotal evidence that people have been cancelling colonoscopies too, just out of fear of attending a health service. So we're really trying to start ramping that up again because um, there's no reason people should be postponing important follow-up care. Yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to add, Camilla, as an update? So Oh, yeah, sorry. Well, I've got the microphone. Sorry. So yeah, that that's great. okay. I'm like, that's a good segue. I'm like, there's silence. And I'm like, mm, awesome. all right. Um, <laughs> so we are, we are, well, as a team, uh, so the whole lot of us are going to um, start a bit of a campaign soon around um, encouraging people to get back onto screening or um, to, um, you know, if they've been reminded not to put that aside, because there is quite a bit of evidence from um, the three screening programs that while Bale is doing okay, the other two have really suffered from people um, assuming that it shouldn't be done during COVID. Um, so we 
we're looking to get the Chief Public Health Officer to do a little video and when we've got that, we'll share that with you guys and you might be able to post it on your practice websites or things like that, just saying, you know, it's, yeah, cancer is not an issue to delay. Um, and um, you'll also see the Cancer Won't Wait stuff from Cancer Australia, which sort of talks about symptom awareness, but we're taking it one step further and talking about um, actually even without symptoms, just doing your regular screening is is um you know, you do not need to postpone that despite the COVID restrictions. So yeah, keep keep your eyes out for that. I'll send it through this group. That's great. Thank you so much, Camilla. And thanks again for your presentation tonight. I think that's everyone that's on the line left now. Um, we've all had a chance to share. So I guess um, I'd just like to wrap up by just saying thank you so much for taking out, you know, almost two hours of your evening tonight sharing with us. Uh, just to receive this update on bowel cancer screening and just things that how South Australia is tracking and how we can support our people from multicultural backgrounds and those who identify as Aboriginal to increase their participation. And I just want to thank you so much, um, yeah, just for your attentiveness tonight and your dedication and uh, just wish you all the best. Uh, as I said, I'm about to go on maternity leave and I'll be away for the next 12 months. Um, so I just, yeah, hope uh, that these next 12 months are very fruitful for you in the work that you do. Keep doing an amazing job. And uh, Jill Miller, my highly esteemed colleague, is going to man the fort, so to speak, and uh, she will continue uh, with the peer support network. So thank you so much again for joining us tonight. And uh, we wish you all the best. The recording will be uploaded onto our website. And as I said, you will receive a survey link, um, just offering some feedback on tonight. And um, the certificates of attendance, I'll follow up with Clayton. Uh, so hopefully they'll they'll come out to you before I go on leave. So thank you so much. Have a lovely night and take care. Thanks, Thanks Carissa. Carissa. Good Not luck. Having a great time. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>